Hello, I'm Kelly McFarland, and this is Diplomatic Immunity from the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. My friends, I want to talk to you today very simply about government. We need to use diplomacy and build international consensus to resolve our problems whenever possible. Our diplomats are working with a range of partners to strengthen human rights protections. This is not a time to undercut our diplomats. And today, in our boasted modern civilization, we are facing just exactly the same problem, just exactly the same conflict between two schools of philosophy. This season on Diplomatic Community, we have tried our best to tell the story of multilateralism through all of its forms, ideas, possibilities, and drawbacks. We sat down with a fellow Hoya, Stéphane Dujeric, the spokesman for the Secretary General of the United Nations, to discuss the most pressing issues facing the UN how he cuts through a media ecosystem clogged with misinformation and disinformation to advocate for the United Nations, and what the Secretary General's priorities are for 2023. Mr. Dujeric became spokesperson for the Secretary General on March 10, 2014. Prior to his appointment, he served as spokesperson for the United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan from 2005 to 2006, and then as Deputy Communications Director for Secretary General Ban Ki-moon from 2006 to 2007. Immediately prior to his current appointment, Mr. Dujeric was the Director of News and Media for the United Nations Department of Public Information, and he also served as Director of Communications for the United Nations Development Program. Let's listen to the conversation. We're excited to have with us today the spokesperson for the UN Secretary General, and that is Stefan Dujaric. And Stefan, thanks for joining us. Welcome. Thank you very much. Great to be here. So, um, you know, we're going to keep it really easy for you today and start off with a light question. Uh, but we're going to get right into it uh, because there are, as you are well aware, many things going on in the world, as there always are. But it seems like there's more and more difficult situations going on today um, and anywhere from the war in Ukraine, food insecurity, climate change, any number of ongoing ethnic conflicts, civil wars. So where do you believe the United Nations can play the most, the, the, the largest role in, in a direct role and, and have an immediate positive effect? Where do you think that is today? Well, in a sense, the UN and the Secretary General has a responsibility to play a role in all of these crises, right? That's, that's part of the, the raison d'etre of, of the UN and right. of, the, of the Secretary General. How we go about it um, depends on the, on the crisis, in a sense, depends on the issue. Um, it also depends on the level of unity of the member states themselves. Uh, a secretary general is much more effective if the whole of the membership is directly behind him when it comes to issues of peace and security, especially the whole of the Security Council. What we're seeing today is not that situation. Uh, we know the divisions that exist within the Security Council. But it's a matter of choosing which levers we we pull and which levers we use. And I'll, let's talk a bit about climate change in a sense. The policies that have to be put in place, the actions that have to be taken in order for us to av avoid this uh, catastrophe, right, uh, are not in the hands of the Secretary General. They're in the hands of governments. They're in the hands of the private sector. So what is the Secretary General's role? One is for him to use his bully pulpit. He has been extremely direct in his language on climate change, uh, direct in his criticism of parts of the private sector, including especially uh, the carbon industry, the oil, uh, oil and gas uh, industry. He's been very direct in criticizing politicians who he feels are putting... Uh, focusing just on the next day instead of the next decade when it comes to this existential threat. Um, so there is the, the, the bully puppet, which is, which is not nothing. There is also the convening power of the UN and the Secretary General. On climate, we meet every year in the more formal settings of the what we call the COPs, the Conference of Parties uh, on Climate Change, which he's directly involved in, involved in, in terms of corralling uh, member states and getting them 
to move forward, not always with great success. And then there is, I would say, the, the more creative uh, ways he goes about it. One an example is he put forward last year this idea of, of building public-private coalitions uh, for what we call just transition to help middle-income countries move from uh, sort of a brown economy to a green economy. Because it, it, obviously we're focused on emissions on, on China and on the US, but a big problem is the middle-income developing countries, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, South Africa, to name to, to, to pick just four. And how do we help those, uh, those countries, those leaders move their economy? And th that what he proposed and what he's put in place for Vietnam, Viet uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, and, and India, are these public-private partnerships to help with investments in green technology, to help with the transfer of uh, of green technology, and to help to help governments make the right policy choices. So that's let's say to just talk about climate, the different ways he's able to to influence. Talk about Ukraine, which is obviously first and foremost on, on, on people's mind. Um, he does not see any immediate prospect for peace. Uh, there is no uh, immediate role for the Secretary General as a mediator. That's been, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's clear. Uh, he continues to call for an end to the war, but along uh, within the, the, the lines of the Charter of the UN, and of international law, a just, uh, a just peace. We face all of that with an extremely divided Security Council, given that one of the belligerents, Russia, is not only a member of the Council, but a permanent member of the, of the Council. So what's left for him? Uh, one is on the humanitarian front. We have a huge humanitarian operation in Ukraine, which we've had, in fact, since 2014, when Russia invaded uh, Crimea and a uh, number of parts of the eastern uh, of eastern Ukraine. We have a very important human rights monitoring uh, mission in Ukraine, which brings to light uh, human rights violations based on the information that we have in an impartial, uh, impartial way. And then I think one of the most important things that he's done um, is he's found a way to get the Russians and the Ukrainians to sit together to agree on the continued export of Ukrainian grain mm -hmm. and Russian grain and Russian fertilizer. I mean, I think as as your as your listeners know, Russia and Ukraine are huge produ uh, producers of uh, of grain, uh, including grain for uh, for animal feed, which is also critical. Russia is one of the world's biggest exporters of uh, of fertilizer, and so he found um, he found a way to get them to sit together during an active war. Right. I mean, every day you have in Istanbul, the coordination center, uh, Ukrainian admirals and Russian admirals sitting across from each other, along with the Turks and the UN, making this thing work. Um, and this is a way to not only at least bring the parties to agree on something while they're fighting each other, but I think most importantly, to, uh, to help with the global food crisis. Right, uh, because we saw the price as soon as the war started. The price of uh, of grain skyrocketed, yeah. uh, fertilizer uh, as well. And since July, when the agreement came into uh, operation, uh, the the price of of grain in the wholesale market has dropped. Right, and we're pushing hard on fertilizer. It's much more complicated because while Russian fertilizer is not um, sanctioned. It is very difficult for the private sector to get involved for shipping uh, and for insurance. And so he has been working very hard with the U.S., with the European Union, to ensure that they are letters of comfort, uh, they are carve-outs, uh, but it remains extremely, extremely uh, difficult. We had one ship of fertilizer uh, leave uh, The Hague for uh, for Malawi, and it's being offloaded right now in uh, in Mozambique. Another one in Latvia should be leaving in the next uh, couple of days, but it's it's a hard slog. But it's one that he's he's found a way to make his office and himself personally useful, not only to to the belligerents in a way uh, to try to at least bring them together, but most importantly for the wider world. Yeah, and it's so interconnected with what the UN 
is doing, should be doing, wants to do, because right. it, it brings together these issues of war and peace, right. plus the food insecurity and humanitarian aid. And I think, um, you know, it also speaks to your point on this issue of, yes, you have problems in the P5 right now because of Russia and, mm-hmm. and the war in Ukraine, um, but it also speaks to the convening power of the UN and the fact that they can bring together these groups to do this. And when eventually, when talks are needed, there is at least some sort of avenue that has already been ongoing and, and the UN has been playing some sort of role. So, exactly. I mean, there's, yeah. in a way, you're not going to have negotiations about the table, right? The, the table and the infrastructure exists. At some point, like in every war, the belligerents are going to sit down and reach mm-hmm. a political solution. We want to see a solution based on international law, based on the UN Charter, but there will be a, a political solution to this. Right, they're, and, they're, and they're not going to have to start from scratch. Exactly, so, exactly. Yes. So as the Secretary General spokesman, how do you tell that story that you were just talking to me? How do you try to tell that to a broader public that's American, Chinese, African, Indian, um, and also, you know, over the last decade, half decade, we've seen the rise of misinformation, mm-hmm. disinformation. How has that made your job more difficult? And how, you know, how do you try to navigate that? So let's take them apart a little bit. I mean, in terms of telling the story, um, it's challenging because I have a, a boss who believes in the need for discrete diplomacy, right? And who believes it's more important to get the issue solved rather than get his image blown up, which is not uh, the case with every world leader uh, mm-hmm. that, that that we deal with. You know, on the, on the, to give you an example, on the grain deal, and which also included the evacuation of civilians from the Azovstal plant uh, in, May of, uh, in May of last year, he told us to go under the radar, right? So others sometimes were speaking in our place but he says, just stay discreet. So he did. We did a lot of off the record and background for the UN, uh, the UN press corps. But only at certain times does he feel he needs to go up and speak uh, speak very publicly. So it's a challenge. Uh, it's a bit of a frustration, I think, for those of us who are paid right. to to communicate because yeah. you want your boss you to be tell. out there. You yeah. want to tell. Uh, yeah. You want to tell the story. Sometimes you have to realize these are stories that will be told in history books as opposed to newspapers or, you know, right. to, to use a 20th century term. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So there is a it, it, it's more for history than for for, for daily news, uh, daily news consumption. That's just kind of a, a an example, a kind of a, a granular example on, on the bigger U.N. story. I think our challenge is that. We have on one hand the world's most recognizable logo, right? You see that logo, you know it's the UN. UN. Just like when you see the gold, you know, you see the big golden M, you know it's McDonald's, and or you recognize the Mercedes logo. The difference between us and Mercedes or McDonald's is that we have no brand discipline, and that's by design. So there's so many people who can speak legitimately on behalf of the UN. And so whether it's the president of Security Council, the president of General Assembly, a special rapporteur on poverty or on the Middle East, uh, the head of the Human Rights Council. And so the the short narrative is always or the short headline is always the U.N. does this or the U.N. fails the people of Syria. Right. Because there's no agreement on who to blame for the use of chemical weapons in Syria. The, The more positive of neutral narrative takes longer to explain and longer to unpack. So we almost need to do a, we need to do a lot of retail outreach to explain the UN. That takes time and it's not really easy easy to do. So the you know the when people say, you know, the UN failed in Syria, our answer is well, okay, Security Council has failed, but it doesn't mean we don't have 400 people right now working for the UN in northwest Syria. Who've never left. We have a few hundred people in in Afghanistan who never left, who are working for the benefit of the people who need help. Right. They're delivering a band aid. It's not we. We, in terms of the Secretary General's office, cannot offer cannot offer the political solution, which has to be agreed on by the Security Council. But the UN itself has not abandoned uh, those people. So yeah. it's it's a. 
it, it's a challenge and it's a difficult one. On disinformation, I can tell you that we're extremely, extremely worried about what we're seeing on social media platforms right now yeah. and on the management of social media platforms. Um, for us, it's a no-brainer that social media platforms are responsible for what's posted on their platforms and should be held to account. The guardrails are few and getting fewer on a lot of platforms, not all of them, but but on a lot. What we're seeing on Twitter right now, uh, just on climate disinformation is extremely worrying. Uh, we're sort of seeing a replay of what we saw on COVID, mm -hmm. right? As we all know, you know, fake news, propaganda, disinformation, whatever you want to call it, travels very fast. Fact-based information is takes longer to chew and digest, right? Yeah. And isn't necessarily as clickbaity either. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So one of the programs we've put forward is a, th is a program called Verified, which uh, the, the, base, the basis of it is that it's not, people don't always believe institutions. So it's not about the UN communicating on climate all the time, but it's on giving factual and science-based information to influencers and helping them promote within their local uh, community. But it's a, it's an uphill battle and one that it, without that we cannot win without the active participation of uh, the technology. Uh, companies. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, something needs to change there before you can really tackle this in any way, shape or form. But so, you know, you mentioned some of the, the, the work and the challenges that the UN takes on and some of them and a lot of them like climate change are these longer term yeah. um, issues that, that we all need to face. And the UN has a, you know, a large part and role in playing in trying to take on those challenges. And the Secretary General uh, at the General Assembly set priorities for 2023 and, no and noted this notion of the ability to look past the preference for the present um, and committing ourselves to long-term thinking and planning. Easier said than done, obviously, uh, especially in some countries where, you know, the United States, a, lot, a large issue with trying to do things like that are election cycles and, and things like that, that just sort of, it's, it's the uh, next two it's, years, it's next It's a democracy years. challenge, it's, it's, right? Yes. I mean, it's... Uh, yeah. So what does this look like in practice? How have you been sort of trying to push that forward since the General Assembly? And um, have you found a receptiveness to this yet? A little early to tell. <laughs> um, well, it's a long term. Exactly. exactly. So, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it is easier said than done. And I think it but it is said by someone who knows that because he's been a politician at home in Portugal. Mm -hmm. He was prime minister for nine years in a parliamentary democracy. He was prime minister of a minority government. So he, in a sense, he knows what he's talking about and he understands the challenges that it poses in some countries that have election cycles, while others have longer cycles, may not even have cycles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where you can take longer term uh, decisions. But his message is clear. It's like, this is, this is too important, right? And what we, I think the, the positive thing that we're seeing is that we're, we're seeing, first of all, huge youth mobilization on climate to keep pressure on, mm -hmm. on, on governments. But we're also th seeing most people's attitude change, not because they, they understand the, the, or they, they, they all of a sudden grasp the, 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 the larger picture, but because their homes are flooded. Right. Every year, as opposed to every five, it's becoming years. apparent for right. more people. Their, you know, their beach houses are gone. Yeah, and I think people are starting to make the connection, um, despite the disinformation, despite the rhetoric uh, from certain political uh, sources. So our our hope is that in a, in a way the voters understand and push their governments to take a longer term approach. Mm -hmm. What is your out long term? Speaking long term again, so what's your long term outlook for multilateralism? Do you think it? Ha are you optimistic about the future of it? I mean, even even with sort of recent turns back to great power competition and great power politics and conventional war in Europe and all these things, do you still think there's a positive 
area and role to play for multilateralism. Besides that, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think if, if the Secretary General were here, he would uh, quote Jean Monnet to you and he said, I'm, I'm neither pessimistic nor op optimistic, I'm determined. And he is determined to keep multilateral multilateralism relevant because we have no other choice, right? right? Whether it's climate, whether it's tech, whether it's it's, it's uh, pandemics, I mean, it's clear to anyone that you can only deal with these issues in a multilateral mm -hmm. basis. The question is, what sort of multilateralism do we have and do we need? His vision is one based on networked or layered multilateralism, where we work much more hand in hand with regional organizations. I mean, we, we've cha we've radically changed our relationship with the African Union. Um, where we help and we support them in dealing with regional crises because we feel that the, the regional multilateral organizations have more effectiveness and more credibility. I mean, we see it um, in West Africa uh, with ECOWAS, uh, with the African Union in certain places, or with SADC in, in Southern Africa in dealing with, you know, with local crises and that you're best having in effect a local fire department deal with the local crisis with the backup and the know-how of of the UN the other multilateralism that he feels very strongly about is including civil society and the private sector in the discussions mm -hmm. which is a challenge for an organization that is a member state organization and not every member state is happy right. to have what we Depends horribly what called uh, right yeah. the multi-stakeholder meetings, right? Because right. they feel only states have the legitimacy, this legitimacy. But how are you going to deal with the text with the challenges of artificial intelligence, social media disinformation, without bringing all of these people around uh, the table? Same thing with climate. Mm -hmm. I mean, on climate, he's you know had meetings with insurers with uh, large pension holders, with investors, because they will be driving this as well. We live in a world where member states no longer have a monopoly of the power, no longer have all the money, right? I mean, right. you look at the money, where's the money? The money is in uh, large multinationals, which can impact all sorts of policymaking at the national or international level. Large foundations, Right. I mean, there are, there are foundations that have billions and billions of dollars that are very active on the public on the public policy stage at the international level. They have to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. It's for the secretary general. It's a recognition of the world that we're living in today in 2023. And what are the who are the actors that you need to bring around the table to solve the problems? Yeah, and I think it's especially important because I, I think for too long, whether it's you know, national governments like the United States or international bodies have have tried to put forward sort of cookie cutter fixes on different areas and different places. But this is a, a realization that, you know, every region isn't the same. The problems yeah. may be they may be the right. same on a macro level, right. but each community is different, has its different yeah. needs, different civil society organizations, different businesses exactly. that are involved in stuff. So I think that's that that sort of looking forward in sort of uh, working through regional bodies, I think, is a, a, a good way to move forward. So. All right. With that, um, we will get you out of here. So, Stefan, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. McFarland. Appreciate it. Take care. Thanks. Not optimistic or pessimistic, but determined. Well, we here at Diplomatic Community are determined to keep the conversation going and bring you more episodes with more great guests talking about multilateral diplomacy. Stay tuned wherever you get your podcasts for more episodes coming very soon. Until we meet again. This episode was produced by Daniel Henderson. Thank you to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for their support for this podcast. Be sure to check out any episodes you may have missed via our website. Please rate, review, and follow this podcast wherever you listen, and tell your friends and colleagues to come find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else they listen. Follow us on Twitter at GU Diplomacy and visit our website isd.georgetown.edu to learn more about our work.